Hello and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for May 2023. This month I'm going to talk to you about the planet Venus, night shining clouds or noctilucent clouds, a rare encounter between the Moon and Jupiter and our constellation of the month which is Lyra, home to some interesting deep sky objects known as the Double Double and the Ring Nebula. Let's begin by taking a look at the planet Venus. Venus is an evening planet throughout May. This is a really good time to observe it because it appears really nice and bright and it takes a while for it to set after sunset. The beginning of the month is a better time than the end of the month. As we get towards the end of May and into June, it will start to disappear a little bit in the evening twilight. You can see that I am looking towards the northwest about an hour and a half after sunset at the beginning of the month and Venus appears here really nicely um, below the bright stars of Capella and Castor and Pollux in Gemini. If we take a look at Venus with a small telescope you might be able to see that Venus shows a phase. And a really nice little project that you can do with Venus is to sketch it over the period of a few days or a few weeks and see how the phase appears to change. There's a really interesting phenomenon with Venus known as the phase anomaly. And what that is, is the that moment of 50% illumination or dichotomy actually occurs a few days later than is predicted. So if you go out and you sketch Venus over... Um, a few days towards the end of May and into early June and see when you think that 50% phase has occurred and then compare that to the predictions, you'll find that it has likely happened a few days later than predicted. Um, and that's because of Venus's thick atmosphere. And the extent to which that happens varies due to the dynamic nature of Venus's atmosphere. So it's really interesting to go out and observe that for yourself and see how big that difference is. Let's have a think about noctilucent clouds now. So talking about Venus to begin with was actually quite handy for noctilucent cloud season because um, we've already said that in May, Venus will be visible above your northwest western horizon after sunset. And that's exactly where we need to be looking for noctilucent clouds. Now, noctilucent cloud season is usually considered to run from late May all the way to early August. So when you're looking for noctilucent clouds, the, a good time to start is towards the second half of the month. And you need to go out about an hour and a half after sunset, one, an hour and a half to two hours after sunset, um, and look just low above your northwestern horizon. Um, sunset towards the end of the month happens at around nine o'clock. Um, it will vary depending on exactly where you are. Um, so I'm going to have a look at about half past ten. Um, on the 20th of June here, I can see Venus very helpfully marking the way for me here. And I'm going to look low above my northwestern horizon. Um, it will be dark at ground level, but the clouds appear to shine because the sun's rays can still reach them because they're at a really high altitude. And the sunlight reflects from the ice crystals, making those clouds visible. Um, and if you're lucky, you might catch a really amazing display. And they often appear an amazing electric blue colour. They have these really interesting intricate structures. They make great photographs. Um, so the way to catch noctilucent clouds is to go out as often as you can on a clear night right the way through the summer um, and see if you manage to see them. The other thing you can do if you're an early riser is to get up in the morning and do the same thing but look above your northeastern horizon about an hour and a half to two hours before the sun rises. Let's take a look at the moon now. The full moon for May occurs on the 5th, sometimes known as the flower moon because of the flowers that are likely to be in bloom during the month of May. The interesting things about the moon that I want to show you this month though occur on the 17th and on the 22nd, 23rd and 24th. I'm going to show you that part first. So here we are on the 22nd and you can see that we've got a lovely lineup of the Moon, Venus and Mars um, shortly after sunset on the 22nd. I've got a very unhelpful tree in my way. Hopefully you won't have that wherever you are. And you can see it's a, a nice thin crescent moon and planet Venus, planet Mars. And if we go to the 23rd, you can see they're now forming a triangle 
and the 24th you can see the moon is now making a close encounter with Mars so it's worth going out over that few days just to see that encounter between those three the close encounter between a planet and the moon that you can look out for this month is between the moon and Jupiter it's quite a rare event because Jupiter, if you're in the right part of the country, Jupiter will be completely occulted by the moon, meaning that Jupiter will appear to pass behind the moon. To be able to see that, you need to be quite far north in the UK. So in Scotland or Northern Ireland, you'll be able to see it. If you're further south, you'll see a very close pass between the moon and Jupiter, which is still quite a rare event. And to add an extra dimension of challenge and interest, the event occurs during the day. And it happens on the 17th of May. So I'm going to go to the 17th and I'm going to go to about four o'clock in the morning. I'm going to look towards the east and we can see the sun is getting ready to rise. The sky is starting to brighten over here. And if I just scroll onwards with time, you can see that Jupiter and the moon appear to rise together, quite close together, just before the sun rises and the moon is a thin crescent. Now the event occurs later in the afternoon so you could if you wanted to go out really early before the sun rises and if you're going to observe this with a telescope you could get your telescope tracking um, and then keep an eye on it throughout the day. Alternatively you can wait until later in the day and look for the moon. You're going to really struggle to spot Jupiter during the day but you might be able to spot the moon. So that will be a challenge in of itself, just spotting the moon. Um, it's good to start just before half past two because the moon will be getting close to the edge of the moon, uh, of the, the Jupiter will be getting close to the edge of the moon around half past two. Um, so if I zoom in here, you can see we've got Jupiter quite close. We've got the crescent moon. If I zoom out, you can see we've got the sun over here. So the important points to consider if you're going to go and try and um, observe this event is you are going to need some sort of optical aid. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to see Jupiter. So you're going to need a small telescope or you're going to need a pair of binoculars. It is daytime, so you need to be really careful about safety. You need to make sure that in at no time are you straying close to the sun with your equipment because you could permanently damage your eyesight very quickly if you can stand in the shadow of a building or some large structure that keeps the sun out of the way um, that will help you and see if you can find the moon and then follow it over the time approaching half past two and as I said depending on where you are will determine what you can see. So I have got my location here set to Leicester, home of the National Space Centre, which is quite far south. So if you're in Leicester, you'll see a glancing pass between Jupiter and the moon. If you're further north, you'll see an occultation. See if we can show that by choosing a more northerly location. So I'm going to change my location here in Stellarium. And I'm going to change it to Glasgow. OK, and you can see down here, I'm now saying that I am on Earth in the city of Glasgow and half past two. You zoom out, you can see where everything is in relation to each other. And there we go. So looking at around 2.42, 2.43 for Jupiter to start to disappear and then there it again reappears just after three o'clock. So if you're in a more northerly location you get an even better show for this particular event than we do down here in the south. Let's go to our constellation of the month now which is Lyra. So I'm going to take us back into the evening sky to find Lyra. You can see that it's here close to Cygnus the Swan and it has the very bright star Vega to help us to find it. And if I put the constellation art on, 
you can see that it is depicted as a lyre, a golden instrument given to the musician Orpheus by Apollo. And the story goes that the music produced was so captivating that it could charm the birds from the trees and the stones on the ground. And Orpheus used the lyre when he accompanied Jason and the Argonauts to drown out the sounds of the sirens who beckoned the sailors to the rocks. If we take a look at Vega, it is a bluish white star. So when you look at Vega, see if you can determine the colour. It's about 25 light years away and one of the brightest stars in the sky. It's also interesting because in 1850, it became the first star other than the sun ever to be photographed. And that was done by William Bond and John Adams at Harvard College Observatory. And they used an exposure of 100 seconds. I'm going to give you a couple of deep sky challenges to do within this constellation now. The first one you should hopefully be able to do with your naked eye and the second one you'll need a telescope for. So the first one is to have a go at spotting what's known as the double-double star, um, the epsilon star in the constellation of Lyra, which if you, you've got Vega over here, if you look over here, you can see that, you can almost see it now without me even needing to zoom in, that this particular star is in fact two stars known as the double double and it's a good test of vision so they're separated by a, a, a distance about one tenth the diameter of the full moon see if you can split them with your naked eye if you can't manage to do it then they do split easily in a pair of binoculars so if you have a pair of binoculars handy you can try and split them in your binoculars if you have a small telescope um three inches or higher in um, the size of the objective lens on the front, um, then you should be able to see that both of these stars are also double stars. So there are in fact four stars in the double-double and that's why it's known as the double-double. The other deep sky object that you can have a go at in Lyra is a really famous one known as the Ring Nebula. You will need a telescope for this one and if you have a small telescope it looks like a faint oval patch. If we find it the way to do it is to look at these two stars or if you have a go-to telescope even better but to have a look at these two stars here and it appears around halfway between them. You can just see my mouse on it now. I'm going to click on it, zoom us in and you may well have seen pictures of the Ring Nebula online from telescopes like Hubble. And it is the remainder of a sun-like star. It's what's known as a planetary nebula. It has a white dwarf in the centre, a white dwarf star in the centre, and it's about 2,000 light years away. And the whole thing is about one light year across. If you want to reveal the central star, the white dwarf in the middle, you'll need a larger telescope, something around six inches in diameter or larger. It's quite hard to spot that. But with a modest sized telescope, you should be able to spot a, a fuzzy oval sized patch. Um, and you'll know that you're looking at this incredible planetary nebula that is a whole light year across. Let's finish by having a think about if there are any good International Space Station passes that you can look out for this month. There is a good one on the 14th of May, beginning at around 11.13. The ones at the beginning of May all seem to be quite early morning, which I think for most people, an evening one is better. But if you do feel like you'd like to catch it in the early morning, um, then you can always use the Spot the Station website to help you to do that. Um, I think we've got it already. There we go. Um, so let's put the mouse on it and just zoom out a little bit. So you can see that um, the ISS is rising in the, um, the southwest. And if I just speed up the time, you can see the path that it takes across the night sky. And that takes about five or six minutes to happen. Um, so if you've got a nice clear sky, Go out and have a look towards your southwestern horizon and see if you can spot the ISS go across. That brings me to the end of our night sky tour for May 2023 and I will be back next month to tell you about what you can spot in June.